So by the 1910s, 1920s, we had a theory of obesity that was about energy in minus energy out because that's all people study. That's all the technology allowed. And in science, you guys probably realize this, the technology you have available determines what questions you can ask. The questions you can ask determines what answers you can get. And the answers you get determines how you think about the problem. And good scientists know that their observations are technology limited. But when I was growing up, the estimate was that only 5% of scientists are good scientists. <laughs> and I, I don't think it's gotten bigger. Um, <laughs> In this case, we, so we end up with a theory of obesity that's an energy balance problem because that's all they could measure. And we end up with a theory of sugar that it's empty calories, which is empty of vitamins and minerals, which is the other thing you can measure, and calories, which are you know, the energy, which you can measure. And then from 1920 onward, there's this explosion in medical research and medical understanding and biology and biological understanding. And by the 1960s, you finally have a technology available that allows you to measure hormones in the bloodstream accuracy. And now you can measure, for instance, the response of hormones to the foods you eat. So you could, there's an entirely different world that you can now begin to understand. And in obesity research, nobody cared. It's like the, this idea that obesity was a hormonal regulatory defect was an excuse that fat people didn't have to eat in moderation and run marathons like the rest of us. And this whole era of sort of a revolution in the science of endocrinology, which is hormones and hormone-related disorders, was in effect thrown out, rendered irrelevant, because by the 1960s, obesity was being studied by psychologists and psychiatrists who thought it was a behavioral disorder. Fat people eat too much. That's all they had to know. One of my favorite um, treatments was to get the wife of the obese individual to not have sex with him if he overate that day. <laughs> Um, so what I've been trying to do in my books, just because I'm the only one who ever bothered to go back and look at this history, which boggles my mind, and I wish somebody smarter than I was was involved in that process, um, I've been trying to say, look, you know, there's obvious mistakes that were made, and the present generation grew up with these mistakes. They were just, you know, they, it was sort of given to them like it was chiseled on stone tablets, you know, and they never thought, they weren't trained to be scientists, or most of them are physicians who aren't trained to question everything. And so we've embraced all these sort of concepts that are naive and 100-year-old science. And if you actually look at what happened since, you end up with these very simple hypotheses, which unfortunately, among other things, implicate sugar and obesity as a prime trigger of obesity and diabetes. And then you've got a whole world where you've got obesity and diabetes epidemics after they increase their sugar consumption.